All right. Hello, everybody out there in TV land, and welcome to another week in space. I am your host with the most, Joan Emerson Bell, or Blind Stallion Space Wizard, depending on uh, where you are catching this report at. Um, I come to you live and in living color uh, every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific time makes that 1 p.m. Eastern time. Ooh, I got it. Um, to bring you the Astro Weather of the Week and to give you a weekly breakdown of what's going on in space. And um, I don't know. I like to do it. I like to get to see everybody. It helps me to stay up on my astrological chops. And I think that this is a helpful way of understanding astrology. Oh, hello from, hello from Athens. What's up? Um, Say say hi to my friend over there. Uh, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Say say hi to Vula for me if you see her. Um, um, that's awesome that you're in Athens, Leslie. Um, I wish I was there. Anywho, um, yeah, I like to uh, break down the astro weather of the week because one, it helps me to stay up on what's going down in space. Two, I think it's a great way of understanding astrology and learning astrology is uh, learning what's happening and the relationships between the planets and how that's affecting us down here on Spaceship Earth and getting to notice what's going on in um, our own um, astrological charts and seeing the kind of relationships between the um, movements and music of the spheres to our own human lives. Um, and I think that it's a lot of fun and I'm glad that y'all are joining me. Um, yeah. What else am I going to say? Um, a little more on my preamble. Um, I, I am teach, I am, uh, co-teaching a four part series with, uh, Lindsay Turner, the bad pastor and their friend, Sarah, who is a, a pastor or works in the church in some capacity. Um, I haven't met them, but they seem pretty awesome. Anyway, uh, we're doing a four-part series on uh, spirit possession and exorcism, which is uh, going to be happening, I believe, October 27th, uh, 28th, 29th, 30th, and then uh, we're having a uh, roundtable discussion on spirit possession and exorcism through an astrological lens on November the 4th. So it's a four-part webinar lecture series. I'm going to be doing uh, my talk um, on the 30th about spirit possession and exorcism through a psychological lens, which I'm super excited about because, um, I don't know, it's an area of great interest to me. And I think that there's a, a lot of really great information there. So um, if you're interested in uh, themes of exorcism or spirit possession and how to conceptualize that through a theological lens, a psychological lens, um, an artistic lens or an astrological lens, uh, join us. There's a link on my stories and I will also put a link in the show notes on uh, the YouTube. The other announcement that I have is, um, uh, and there's been some talk about Greece in the chat here, but I'm going to be co-facilitating um, a retreat in Greece next September um, looking at uh, sacred sites and sacred waters, and uh, I'll be doing a lot of the mythology and star myths and um, and uh, uh, astrological correlations uh, during the retreat, and that's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be happening in Epidavros and um, in different areas in Greece um, as we go to sacred waters. Uh, so that's next September um, uh, in 2025. And today is the last day for the Eclipse sale uh, where you can book a reduced rate. So if you're interested in that, um, there's also a link in my stories. And I'll also put a link in the show notes on the YouTube. Um, um, ooh, yeah, Leslie, we should talk more about that uh, in the not so distant future. We have, uh, yeah, thank you. So anyway, with uh, without further ado, I think that's all the kind of news and announcements. Let's uh, get into the astrology of the week. Um, so the big player this week is we have a uh, annular solar eclipse that is occurring at 10 degrees and four arc minutes of Libra. This will be happening Wednesday, October the 2nd. 
And an annular eclipse is a uh, ring of fire eclipse. So it's not total, but the uh, moon and the sun are very close to the uh, south node of the moon, which make, makes this a near total eclipse. Uh, so it's going to be like a ring of fire uh, around the eclipse disk, which will be visible from the southern tip of South America, I believe, and also parts of uh, Argentina and Chile. Um, so, but even though you can't see it, uh, an eclipse is still happening and it's still having an effect on the system and on our lives and on the world. So that's the big player of the week. And we'll get into that in a minute, but kind of leading up to that on Monday, which, oh, that's today, uh, September the 30th, we have Mercury conjunct the sun at eight degrees of Libra. And I believe that is pretty close to the uh, south node of the moon as well. Uh, let me just check my chart. Yeah, the south node is at six degrees and the Mercury, um, the Mercury Sun Kazemi is at eight degrees. So just two degrees away. Um, so I think there's some south node themes that are coming up with this uh, Kazemi. And so, um, uh, with this conjunction, right, the when whenever the sun and Mercury conjunct, it is a reset of the Mercury cycle, which Mercury doesn't make it all the way around the zodiac, right, um, away from the sun. Mercury sort of like hangs out around the sun and moves back and forth, right? Um, and so every time there's a conjunction, there's sort of a reset of that cycle. And Mercury is our uh, kind of rational cognitive functioning um, coming in to conjunct the sun, which we can think about as uh, consciousness, right? We get an opportunity for a moment of clarity. So that being said, there may be some clarity that comes in today um, around uh, challenging situations or things that we've been chewing on or things that have sort of made it um, moved away into the distance that we're like, oh, like it's just on the tip of my tongue. We might get some clarity around that. We also might have to create some space for some clarity, right? Um, because we may be receiving messages, but if the, uh, you know, if we're on the phone, right? <laughs> Uh, sitting on hold, we might not hear the message coming in, right? So um, we can think about what are the ways that we can keep the phone lines clear today, right? What are the ways that we can create the conditions to receive the clarity that might arise from uh, Mercury's conjunction with the sun? And one of the ways that I like to conceptualize the Kazemi moment is Mercury the messenger sort of going into the throne room of the sun, whatever that looks like in your mind. I have a pretty vivid picture of that and sort of making this offering of the information that Mercury has gathered, right? And putting that into the altar, right? Or the uh, eternal flame in the um, throne room of the sun and sort of uh, letting, letting that all go or like processing that information and creating some space for something new to arise. And maybe, maybe there is a kind of download from that solar light, right? Um, another thing to kind of consider is that with this Kazemi, and every time there's a Kazemi, Mercury, again, is moving, you know, either uh, in front of the sun, moving faster than the sun, or moving slower than the sun um, through that, like, retrograde process. Now, Mercury, this is the superior conjunction, right? So Mercury is direct, and they are moving um, faster than the sun. And so they're going to be moving uh, from a morning star to an evening star, right? So we will see them No, I mean, they are kind of in the... Uh, um, aura of the sun now, so they're washed out, right, which also uh, can create some problems if we think about uh, the sun kind of overpowering or washing out Mercury, right, so maybe there is the solar conscious idea that is kind of washing out or hijacking some of our intellectual processing, you know, and then Mercury moves into the heart of the sun and we get some clarity, we get this aha moment, right, and then Mercury will keep moving faster than the sun, Right, and move back into that combust phase, which is, you know, being uh, washed out by the light of the sun. And then um, eventually we will see Mercury on the western horizon um, just after the sun sets, um, rather than on the eastern horizon right before the sun rises. And so with this shift, we can also think about what is the day thinking versus night thinking, right? What is the uh, nighttime way of making connections and processing information and having conversations, right? Versus the daytime way 
of making conversations and processing information and making connections. So I think that's a kind of interesting thing to consider, right? To uh, uh, think about is our, our day consciousness versus night consciousness. And Mercury as the messenger and the psychopomp goes both ways, you know, and it's sort of like wherever they are, they're doing their thing, right? And so um, they are just as comfortable at night as they are during the day. Um, but it, I think it provides a different flavor, a different shade of what's going down and how we process information and how we relate to Mercury. You know, I think that this is also uh, important to consider because this is a uh, component of Wednesday's eclipse, right? Um, so the sun is about to be eclipsed, right? And Mercury is the messenger um who uh you know is like riding right along with the sun right now and is going to be part of this eclipse is going to be eclipsed with the sun um and so uh mercury might have some information for the sun as they both go into the darkness of the eclipse and again mercury the psychopomp who can go into the underworld who can uh commune with the dead who can uh receive information from uh the oracle in the underworld Right. And to bring that back up into consciousness. Right. The sun, um, the sun sort of like just shines its light constantly, but Mercury is moving between the realms. And as Mercury uh, in the heart of the sun may be like washed out with that kind of like solar force, you know, and then this eclipse happens and something uh, that solar force becomes subverted and information might come up from underneath from the depths, right, that we might um, process in a new way. And Mercury might have some information for the sun during this Kasimi moment of this is what it's like to go into the underworld to get swallowed up. Right. And so we might also want to pay attention to that. You know, because part of an eclipse is the uh, old sun dies and a new sun is reborn, right? The old order of consciousness fades and a new order emerges. Um, yeah. And so I think we can just move. Uh, let me just check my notes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I think that we get... Today, with this Kazemi, we get the opportunity for clarity, right? And the opportunity for things to be revealed, to make connections, for things to make sense in a new way. Um, you know, and I think that um, there is a lot of noise in the world, right? And I think that is a function of being alive, but also a function of where we are in the world in the evolution of our history. You know, and I think that there's a lot of desire to know Mercury wants to put the pieces together, right? To come up with like, you know, this is all the information and I'm putting it together and I'm filling in the dots, right? And I'm making a picture, right? And I think one of the things that comes up with this eclipse is, you know, uh, as the sun is sort of swallowed in darkness and there's uh, that solar light is subverted, there's an opportunity for the unconscious to arise and to emerge and um, to uh, take prominence, right? And I think that there is uh, a piece around not knowing, right? In the darkness, we don't know, right? We're not sure what things are. And we have to trust our intuition to know how to navigate through that darkness. And I think Mercury has that capability um, and being able to tune into that intuitive knowing of Mercury as the psychopomp and as the messenger and as the guide, right? And not relying on the consciousness on the eyes as much as the inner, inner knowing, right? And the intuition, in the felt sense, right? And so I think some of the wisdom of this eclipse is, you know, how do we, how are we okay with not knowing? And what are other ways of knowing that are not connected to the sort of solar consciousness, you know? And this eclipse and this conjunction, this Kazemi is happening in um, Libra, right? Which is about balance, you know, and what is the balance between giving and receiving, right? Between the active and the passive and uh, the balance between wanting to know and just being able to be with, right? The balance between action and allowing, you know, and Libra is very much about kind of analyzing and coming to terms with what we are holding in the scales, right? The Libra and scales. And it's like, I got this and I got this and like this, what is this in relation to that, right? And it's, trying to um, find the harmony between these two things. Okay, like this is a little heavier than that. Like maybe like remove something from there. Oh, oh that's a good balance, right? 
And so we're looking at ways of comparison here. And we're working with uh, comparing what is known and what is unknown. And with this eclipse, I think what is conscious and what is unconscious. And I think that this being on the south node, we are looking at what is like being released or what is be what we can let go of to come into a better sense of balance. And I think part of that comes in with the analysis of like, where are we at? Right. What What's going on with the scales? What's going on with what we're holding? Is something out of balance? Is something out of whack? And if so, what can we let go? What can we alter? What can we adjust in order to uh, create a more harmonious and balanced uh, way of being in the world and way of being with ourselves? Right. And so, you know, I think we are balancing in, in this eclipse, the seen and the unseen and the old world, which um, maybe like there's old patterns and ways of doing things that need to be released so that a new world uh, can be born, right? And we're holding the, that like old world mentality in the new world that is struggling to be born. Um, and Mercury as the god of the crossroads stands at the crossroads between the past and the future, which is where we find this present moment. And so I think some of the clarity that we get is about being in presence and the uh, noticing of like, what is the alignment? What is the balance here, right? Um, in this present moment, not next week, not last week, but like right now. And I think that is uh, some of the clarity that we can receive today from this Kazemi. And, you know, while I'm talking, you might want to sit for a moment and notice like, what does it feel like in my body? What's going on right now? As I'm listening to this person sort of yammer and ramble, right? But like, what does it feel like to be in balance in my body? Right? What does it feel like to come into a sense of harmony or alignment in my body? You know, if that's accessible. Or maybe just holding this idea of like, what does it feel like for me to be balanced right now? So that brings us to Wednesday, which is the big moment in uh, the week. Um, we're getting this annular solar eclipse at 10 degrees and uh, 10 degrees and four minutes of the cardinal air sign of Libra. Um, so this is a south node eclipse, just a couple degrees away from the south node, which is going to um, form a ring of fire right around that eclipse, which again will be visible from um, uh, the southern tip of South America, mostly. Um, during this eclipse, we have uh, Mercury, uh, sorry, the conjunction with Mercury, the sun and the moon conjunct each other, making a new moon, right? And that is the solar eclipses. We have the uh, moon moving between us and the sun. And hey, fun fact about uh, life on Earth, and this one always staggers me, is that the distance of the sun and moon from us on Earth and the relative dis difference in their sizes, when they line up in space, uh, the moon can completely cover the sun, which is just, I find that phenomenal. And that is, I think, a proof that we live in a magical world, um, that the uh, distance of the sun and the Earth uh, the sun and the moon and the earth and their size differences um, line up perfectly when they uh, overlap. Anyway, a new moon is a, a solar eclipse is a new moon eclipse where uh, the moon passes between us and the sun, blocking out the sun's rays perfectly um, for a little bit of time. All right, and this one not totally perfect. Again, we're going to get that uh, corona, that um, ring, ring of fire around it. Um, so uh, during this new moon solar eclipse, uh, we will have a conjunction with Mercury, who will be one degree away, just meet, moving um, out of the center of the sun. Um, we have Mars uh, at 15 degrees in Cancer squaring uh, this new moon, which is at 10 degrees of Libra. Um, and we also have a grand water trine. So Mars at 15 Cancer, Venus at 11 Scorpio, and Saturn at 14 Pisces, all coming into harmonious relationships. These are all in water signs. And so they are uh, forming supportive relationships with each other and um, emotional kind of support for each other. Um, so we can think about Mars and Saturn and Venus as our emotional support team um, as we are kind of moving through this eclipse, which I think is going to be... I don't know. It's going to be interesting. We're going to sort of get deeper and deeper into it through the course of this talk. But 
I think um, one of the things that is available during this is emotional support. And to think about what are the ways that we can be there for each other? And what are the things that help to support you emotionally? Um, because I think one of the things that's going to occur during this eclipse is that feelings are going to uh, come to the surface. I think that this is part of what happens during eclipses is that um, old patterns and old feelings get kind of drawn to the surface so that they can be released. Um, and this is not necessarily necessarily comfortable. And so to think about what are the uh, support systems that you can have in place. So if you feel dysregulated, if you feel activated, if you feel triggered, you can reach out or self-soothe in healthy ways, right, in conscious ways, um, that you can find emotional support in your area, in your system, in your relationships, and in your life, and not just feel like, oh, man, this is a lot that's coming up, and I don't know what to do with it. You know, um, because I think that um, this this uh, water trine uh, lends a lot of emotional support in the kind of astrological map, which is great. And also, uh, we might want to think about this in our actual physical daily lives and like where we can access that, because I think the astrological map can help mirror how we participate down here on Spaceship Earth. Right. So. <clears throat> Um, you know, with this Libra new moon eclipse on the south node, you can think about letting go, right? The south node is a release point. It is uh, this point of letting go or like the accumulated stories that we are working with and, you know, noticing, uh, okay, if the accumulated stories are in one pan of the scale and like this is what I want to do in the other pan of the scale, what might need to be released, untangled, unraveled and let go of so that I can make a little bit more space so that we can bring this into balance, you know, because maybe we're operating on old outdated ideas which are no longer serving us and the places that we want to go in our lives collectively and individually, right? With, um, with Mercury involved, right? We might be thinking about letting go of old thought processes, right? Or outdated ways of communicating, right? Maybe there's like ways that um, we are using humor to communicate that like doesn't really fit who we are anymore. Maybe there's communication patterns that we learned from um, our uh, family of origin or connection with our friends growing up that like actually don't fit who we want to be. Um, so thinking about like what might be kind of outdated, right? Um, Libra also uh, has a tendency of like people pleasing that might be one of the shadow sides, right? So we might uh, be letting go of people ple pleasing thought patterns, right? Or ways of thinking that um, put other people before ourselves, right? Or uh, negate ourselves. And again, coming back to this idea of the scale is like, where am I in the scale, right? Where is the other in the scale? How can I move towards the center of the scale and be the balance point instead of constantly like feeling like I'm not good enough or I'm not worthwhile or I need to do this thing to fit in or I need to be okay um, through, you know, uh, making other people feel okay, right? Just, you know, and I don't know if this is you or not, and it might not be, and that's okay, right? So, um, but we're just considering like what might be in the pans of the scale, right? Um, and so, you know, um, there might be uh, Mercury rules connections and thinking in the way that we uh, intellectually process information. And so there might be old processes that are keeping us from being in balance. Right? And I think about social media and the ways that we process information, the way uh, and how it feels um, you know, to be in that sort of like scrolling and doom scrolling and processing information through like all of these windows and screens. And I think that there's actually a finger on the scale of an algorithm that's like, you should look at this, right? And then, you know, our processes are, you know, our mercurial processes are bent in that direction. And so to think about, okay, how do I untangle that or let that go, right? Or am I taking in the information that I want or am I like being fed things, right? Um, and so that also might be something to consider. And so, you know, as the uh, sun and the moon sort of 
meet up in space right and there is this subversion of the solar rational logic of the uh supremacy of the solar the solar king right is that is sort of swallowed and uh darkness ensues for a while right there is a rift in the conscious order um you know i think it provides an opportunity to shift things and do things differently and so what happens if we get quiet and go inward and what messages might we receive from the South Node, from the tail of the dragon, which is releasing and letting go and untangling and excreting, right? What messages might that have for us? And what um, parts of ourselves might need to uh, let some things go? And so another thing to consider with this eclipse um, is that Mercury is the rational mind, right? And we can think about this as the neocortex, which is responsible for reasoning, conscious thought, sensory perception, and episodic memory, right? Which is like, I did this, like I woke up, I had, I took a shower, I had breakfast, you know, prepared this thing, now I'm here, right? The story, right? We can think about, um, you know, this neocortex kind of makes sense of things. The sun, we can think about as consciousness. So everything that we know, that is illuminated, that we understand, which makes up our sense, our sense of self and who we know ourselves to be in the world, right? This like, this is me and this is my understanding of things. And I think the, the solar sense of self is reinforced by the information that is being processed in the neocortex. The timeline of events and how we make sense of those events um, and uh, how those events occur in relation to ourselves and who am I in, in relation to all of you, right? This is all kind of neocortex processing. When we bypass the neocortex, we go into the midbrain and um, we get what is called Right, the midbrain is the mammalian brain, which is where the limbic system and the amygdala and our fight or flight and emotional responses are. And this is where uh, the feelings about the events are stored. So we may know logically that, uh, you know, uh, we lost a job or if we had a falling out with a friend or something like that, it's going to be okay. We will find another job. We might repair with the friend, right? But the midbrain, right, the subcortical brain, the sort of um, emotional uh, part uh, is holding activation and feelings around those events. So we, uh, logically, we might be like, this is fine. Like, you know, I said that thing, that person was mad, I'll call them in a couple days, it'll be okay. But in the midbrain, it might be holding a much different story, which is like, it's not going to be okay, right? Um, it might be saying, uh, right, like the midbrain is holding activation and feelings around these events and making all of these connections that are related to old survival stories that might say, I'm not good enough or nobody likes me. I'm not going to survive. Everyone's going to hate me. I'm going to be ostracized. I'll never work in this town again. Right. Meanwhile, or like, you know, neocortex is like, oh, it's cool. I'm going to get on LinkedIn. I'm never getting on LinkedIn, by the way. <laughs> Or like, I'll reach out to other people, right? But um, in the sort of midbrain, it's like, oh, hell no, something is not right. I'm not going to be okay, right? And so it's making these connections to uh, like all of these old survival stories. And these stories are adaptive strategies that helped us to make sense of the world at certain times. Now these stories are buried somewhere in our system and being reinforced by events that create difficult emotions that also confirm these stories, right? So if there was a story that we had when I was seven, right, that I'm not going to be okay because of the, these kids don't like me, that story gets sort of like um, buried into my programming system, into my OS, Right. And then that's looking for reinforcement. Right. And every time it finds reinforcement that like builds a bigger ball of this story that says it's not OK, I'm not going to be OK. Right. And so these are sort of like programs that are running in the background right, on your computer or your phone. Right. These are part of the iOS or OS or operating system. So anyway. Right. My hypothesis is that during the solar eclipse, which is occurring on both Mercury and the sun, right, there is an opportunity to bypass the conscious and rational part of the brain, right, and move into this subcortical processing um, where these 
uh, which allows these uh, deeper emotions to come up. Right. Again, if we think of the sun as this consciousness, right, and Mercury as a rational processor, right, that is feeding that sort of conscious story, and both of these things become eclipsed, right, and go offline for a little while, right, there is an opportunity for these feelings to come up or for them to be more easily accessed, which also means that we can be easily triggered, right, or easily activated just by somebody saying something or even the places that we look in the world, right? Um, a solar eclipse sort of subverts the rational conscious mind and provides access to all of this unconscious or uh, this unconscious information or to these deeper regions in the brain. And this may, uh, this may be enhanced by Mercury's proximity to the sun, which allows for clarity and the ability to process. So even though, right, Mercury and the sun are being eclipsed, like I think what we're, what it, what we're going to see is processing in a different way or new types of information coming up in our system, right? Um, and so I think that we're, um, there's an opportunity for access to the deeper emotional brain and the feelings that are associated with things, right? And this provides an opportunity for us to let go of old beliefs, right? Because they can come to the surface. And if we allow them to move through us, right? Then it allows us to release and let go of old stories, old belief systems. Um, and this allows us to sort of update our kind of personal operating system. And uh, which all sounds great, right? Except for like, this tends to be incredibly uncomfortable, right? So having powerful feelings come up um, and coming to the surface seemingly out of nowhere is like a little destabilizing. So you might want to think about the ways that you can give yourself space to allow whatever wants to come to the surface so that you can move through it in ways that feel all right for you. And also remember, we are all in this together, right? So remember when I was talking about this sort of grand water tribe and our emotional resources and our emotional support systems, right? So thinking about like people that we can reach out to and have in our corner and the ways that we can show up for other people and also knowing that like everybody may, may be going through this, right? As the rational conscious part of the self sort of goes offline for a little bit and becomes eclipsed and becomes swallowed up, right? And all of this sort of older information um, has the opportunity to move to the surface, right? How do we hold this for ourselves? How do we hold this with each other? And also, how do we remember that like random people on the street are also probably going to be feeling this, right? So how do we have compassion for other people because we are all going through this in our own ways, right? And uh, other people might not be aware of what's happening in their internal systems, right? People who don't really know that there's an eclipse happening or know what that means, or uh, maybe don't have awareness of, you know, I don't know, larger systems, whatever, who knows, right? But like random people are going to be feeling these feelings also. And so, you know, there may be feelings of overwhelm, Right? And what do we do when we get overwhelmed? People shut down, people act irrationally, people get reactionary, right? And so just being aware of that, being aware of what's coming up in yourself and being aware that other people might be having similar uh, experiences and those experiences might be destabilizing and folks might not, not know how to handle it. So just be gentle with yourself and with each other this week. And allow yourself the space to process whatever comes up so that it can come up and out and move through and that we don't need to cling to it. So, whew. all right, I just wanted to take a deep breath there, you know. Um, and I want to, this is uh, not going to, I might like sort of bob and weave all over the place today. I uh, just wanted to put that out there. I've been kind of thinking about this in a, in a bunch of different frameworks. And one of them is through uh, the alchemical idea of the black sun or the soul Niagara, right? Um, which is, I think, what happens in an eclipse, right? We have the sun that is, uh, we have a black sun, right? A sun that is swallowed by darkness. And to think about what I mean, we kind of maybe have a sense of what that looks like, but what that means to have a sun radiating in the dark. Right. 
an eclipse represents the death of the sun. It's the old king and the old ways of knowing being devoured so that it can be regenerated and born again. And again, the sun represents the sort of rational order, consciousness, stability, vitality. However, over time, the old order becomes perverted or it becomes frail or just a shell of its former self and no longer is connected with the life and vitality of the world. And so it needs to be regenerated. It needs to be sacrificed so that a new order that is more in alignment with the needs of the time, the spirit of the time, uh, can emerge. Right. And so it needs to be rejuvenated and swallowed up and reborn in the belly of darkness. And so this is a time period where old consciousness can die so something new can be born. Um, and this idea of the soul Niger, the black sun, is related to the unconscious depths of the soul and the uh, con uh, connection with the chaos of everything, right? The interconnection of everything, which is chaos, where the sun is like, there is only this, right? You look outside during the day, it's like, you can see everything. There is the sun, it is cohering, right? It makes sense, but you don't see any, you don't see any of the stars. You don't see our relationship to outer space, Right. When the sun goes away, things are in darkness, things are in shadow, like things are in a liminal space, things can be other than what they are. Right. And we also get all of the information of the dome of the sky and all of the stars, the constellations. Right. And so it's a different way of knowing. And right, there's uh, more kind of chaos and interrelation um, in the darkness. Right. And so there is a connection to the everything. But when the sun is there, it is just the sun, right? It is just that solar light, which is radiating um, stability, right? And so uh, during the eclipse, it gives us access to this sort of unconscious way of being, um, the depth of knowing and the kind of interrelated chaos of everything and chaos, not in a bad way, right? Just the chaos and the multiplicity, which may be a better term, um, And so, you know, this as the sun gets sort of swallowed up in that uh, cohering principle dissolves for a while, it gives us the opportunity to tune into something else. And well, I wonder if this is appropriate, but um, let me just read a passage um, from uh, uh, Stanton Marlin's The Black Sun, which um, I started reading. I wanted to get through all of it yesterday so that I could uh, perform it <laughs> for this talk. But um uh, alas and alack, I only got through part of it. But I think, you know, as as we move into this eclipse and this idea of the black sun, it's also the uh, kind of uh, negredo principle of alchemy, which is the beginning of the work. Um, and I think one of the ways that we come into the negredo, which is characterized by darkness, death, rotting, decay, right? All of those gross things, right? That don't feel good. But this is where the uh, great work of alchemy begins, is in this darkness and in this dying and this releasing and rotting and letting go. And, um, you know, you know that the work is beginning when things smell like shit, right? When it feels bad. Right. That's when the great work begins. And this is one of the reasons that I actually love alchemy is because when you're like, oh, this is awful. You're like, OK, great. I'm on the path. I'm in the right place because this feels so bad. And I think one of the ways that we gain access into this negredo state is when things are totally out of balance and when things are really out of whack. Right. When our homeostasis is off. And if you've ever been in a period of your life where like things have been going really poorly, Right. It tends to be a place of wild imbalance where then we have to reorient ourselves and refocus ourselves in order to come back into a better sense of balance, which helps us to do all of this inner work. Right. And to shift things in our lives so that we can come into a better and more appropriate alignment for where we find ourselves in the world. And so anyway, I wanted to read uh, just a little bit about this kind of uh, Negredo period or the Black Sun. Um, and this is uh, Stanton Marlin quoting uh, Carl Jung. So right at the beginning, you meet the dragon, right? Which an uh, eclipse is a meeting with the dragon, right? It is uh, the sun and moon being swallowed by the dragon, right? K2 and Rahu, uh, Rahu being the dragon's head, um, which was the last eclipse. And this is K2, which is the dragon's tail where we have been uh, eaten and then digested. And now we're being extracted 
excreted by the uh, cosmic dragon. So right at the beginning, you meet the dragon, the chthonic spirit, the devil, or as the alchem alchemist called it, the blackness, the negredo. The encounter, this encounter produces suffering. Um, and this encounter produces suffering. Jung goes on to say that in psychological terms, the soul finds itself in the throes of melancholy locked in the struggle with the shadow. The black sun, soul Niger, is one of the most important images represented in this phase of the process, in this condition of the soul. Usually this image is seen as phase specific to the early part of the opus and is said to disappear when the dawn, aurora emerges, right? So this is the kind of entering into the darkness, into the chaos, the meeting with the dragon, right? And we are being slowly digested by this uh, dragon, right? And being like caught in melancholy and in balance and uh, dealing with the shadow or the disowned parts, right? Which this kind of struggle um, uh, occurs in, until and persists until uh, we reach the dawn, a new light of consciousness, a new understanding that emerges through that like chaotic uh, sitting with um, and being with the discomfort, right? And so I think that uh, this sort of struggle helps us to understand, okay, this is what's out of balance, right? And as we sit in the shadow, as we sit with the discomfort, as we sit in the melancholy, as we sit in the uh, digestive tract of this dragon, right, recognizing, okay, what needs to be released? What doesn't serve me anymore? Right. So what can we let go of to come into a better sense of balance? Right. And so Libra is also a relational sign, right? We talk about the self and the other in our relationship. And I think that the work in this eclipse is going to be reflected through the mirror of relationship. Right? So what is no longer working can be reflected to us and seen uh, in our relationships with others. You know, and I think that relationship is amazing because it provides accountability when we are just in the like Aries place. We're like, I want to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it. And that's totally fine. And if you don't like it, I'll just leave. I'll go someplace else. Right. But relationship, we are sort of like locked in accountability and hey, we are relational creatures. So you can't escape that. Right. We can't run away from it. You know, and so this being a South Node eclipse, we are reflecting on the past and old patterns that no longer serve us, thinking about what stories we can let, let go of, right? What old survival plans, what old uh, survival patterns, what old ways of doing business and our coping mechanisms and adaptations, which no longer, which we may no longer need. Oof, right? And I think that this is going to come up through the container of relationship, right? Coping mechanisms, adaptations, the way that we do relationship, the way that we think about ourselves, the way that we relate to others, right? I think that we're going to see this reflected through the mirror of relationship, right? And this could come up in ways like I need to uh, get it right or I need to be the smartest, right? These sort of adaptations, right? Um, being like, I need to perform to deserve love, right? I need to do X, Y, or Z or be the best, right? Um, yeah, and to think, of, like, as we notice these things coming up, to think about, okay, uh, does this serve me? Is this appropriate for where I am? What might be a better story that I can tell, right? And these attachment adaptations or coping mechanisms uh, may be... Uh, really attached to the old king, right? That solar consciousness that made uh, sense of the world through chaotic times. And maybe uh, it's time for that old king to be sacrificed, right? And to allow the intuitive knowing to emerge from the darkness. And I think that this um, allows for a new order to, to emerge from the black sun that shines in that darkness and that kind of orientation point in the unconscious and the subconscious, right? And so we also have Venus, who is the ruler of the south node, who is in Scorpio, a sign where Venus is not the happiest, right? And so I think uh, Venus in Scorpio really wants to get to the heart, like dig deep to the core, wants to get to know uh, the object of affection from the inside out, right? And again, Scorpio is connected with deep survival fears, 
and Venus may uh, be experiencing attachment wounds and core attachment wounds, right? That might be coming up during this eclipse, right? And so I think that like there's going to be a lot of stuff being dredged up, right? But Venus is also in this grand trine with Mars and Saturn, which I think provides the courage to go deep, right? And the ability to dig deep and the structure to support this process. So again, leaning into connection, leaning into resources and knowing that you don't have to do this alone. Um, and Gina Maria saying that they love the idea of the old king being sacrificed. Me too, right? And so the other piece that I want to bring in is like Libra is also about justice and social justice, right? And to think about as we are having this eclipse in Libra, like what does justice look like? And what are the old patterns and beliefs that are standing in the way of real justice and equality and equanimity, right? And think about climate justice and social justice. And um, I meant to start off with this, but I just want to acknowledge the uh, horrific flooding that's happening in Appalachia, in North Carolina, and uh, just sending some love and care and support to the folks there who are um, in a like pretty shitty situation. And I hope that there is the, uh, you know, we're talking about emotional support, and I hope that the emotional support is there. And I also hope that there is the economic and actual physical support that is there. And, you know, I think that astrology is great for making sense of things in a kind of theoretical framework. And also, you know, in times of crisis, like we need actual real physical solutions, you know. <clears throat> yeah, and there's a toxic chemical fire in Georgia, right? And, you know, these things are like pretty terrifying and uh, heartbreaking, you know. And, I think that they bring uh, to the surface like a deep sense of injustice and imbalance um, around climate crisis, around climate change, right? Around the effects that uh, climate crisis and climate change is having, having on all people and especially marginalized people who are needing to bear the brunt of a lot of it and who are going to have to uh, uh, make sacrifices and changes of lifestyle um, to be able to, I don't know, accommodate the uh, wealthy who are like, you know, uh, contributing at a um, disproportionate amount and who are probably not going to be as affected, you know, and at the same time that this is happening, the U.S. just gave a Israel $8.7 billion, right, to continue supporting what looks to be like you know, an endless war with two nations, which includes, you know, the bombing of civilians and uh, civilian infrastructure, which are both war crimes, right? And, you know, the uh, funding of countries that are involved in war crimes and gen genocide violates U.S. law, yet we continue to ignore these laws and send money to Israel, right? Which, like, hits me in a deep sense of injustice, and, um, you know, is heartbreaking, right? And meanwhile, while this is happening, right, we have these horrible floods in Appalachia, in Appalachia right? An utter disaster where people have lost everything and are cut off from communication and basic necessities like food and water. And I bet that $8.7 billion would go a long way to helping people rebuild homes and businesses and infrastructure and all those things that got washed away, right? Or at least feel supported and seen and cared for. You know, and uh, I'm, again, I'm bringing this up because Libra at its core is about justice and social justice and balance and uh, watching money go to fund genocide and war, right, while people are suffering from climate-driven catastrophe feels really unjust to me. And that feels incredibly unbalanced, right? And also, I think there's a component where uh, military operations have a hugely negative impact on the climate, not just on people in their lives, but also on the climate. If you think about planes and bombs and, you know, military transport and all of this, right? And so while, you know, funding a uh, war, right, which is increasing uh, climate, like uh, carbon emissions and climate catastrophe and toxicity and pollution, right? Meanwhile, like we are seeing the real effects of climate change, like feels incredibly unbalanced and unjust and heartbreaking, right? And not just like unbalanced, but also unhinged. And so <clears throat> one of the things that I think about with the uh, uh, 
south node in Libra. Yeah, and uh, somebody's saying all this stuff travels on the wind and the ocean, right? And we are all interconnected, right? And I think we are at a time where, like, we recognize the uh, level of interconnection and how, like, when a decision is made in one country and an action is taken in another, it also affects everybody. All right. And again, it is usually the people who have the least who are the most affected by these decisions that are made at high levels of government, very far away. Right. And they impact the people who have the least resources. Um, and those people have to bear the brunt of the pain, usually with very little institutional support. And so Another kind of component of this that I just want to bring in, um, you know, uh, Stephen Forrest, who is one of my teachers and a brilliant evolutionary astrologer, um, was talking about the South Node in Libra. And one of the things that he said that has stuck with me is uh, peace at any cost, right? And this idea of like, you know, bending the rules for peace, right? which peace at any cost also like tends to mean like all out war, right? Which we're really seeing with um, uh, Israel and Palestine during this iteration of the South Node in Libra. And I think that the North Node in Aries uh, is like Netanyahu, who is like pretty much a warmonger in my opinion, right? And these are just my opinions. You can think whatever you want. Um, but for me, I feel like it's important to talk about this. Um, and the like, Netanyahu as the as Rahu in or Netan Rahu as the bad pastor says, right? Who is you know basically um, bent on all out war, um, you know, and then the sort of uh, twisting and contorting that needs to happen on the South Node Libra end to like legitimize that, right, in a justice system or an idea of justice, right? And the last. I'm bringing this up because the last time the South Node was in Libra was 2004 through 2006, which is when the U.S. was involved in war crimes in Abu Ghraib prison and the uh, torture of uh, detainees and prisoners of war. Right. And during that time, and this is a very fucking South Node and Libra thing to do, the U.S. rewrote articles of war to justify the tortures of prisoner. So um, they change the language, right, around uh, detainees, right, or prisoners. And so torture became enhanced interrogation, right? So it was no longer torture. And prisoners became uh, enemy combatants. So they were no longer prisoners of war who were subject to the Geneva Convention, right? So this allowed the U.S. to sidestep the Geneva Con Convention, right, and do whatever they wanted to do, um, which was torturing prisoners. Um, and I think similar things are happening with the South Node and Libra now and the U.S. turning a blind eye to the genocide and war crimes that are happening in the Middle East and continuing uh, uh, to fund uh, a government which is engaging in genocide and acts of terrorism, which violates U.S. and uh, international law. Um, last time South Node was in Libra was uh, 2004. Four, it was December 27, 2004 to June 22nd, 2006. Um, okay, so I'm about at time, but I wanted to bring in one last thing. Um, if y'all want to sit, sit with me through this, um, just to kind of like round this out. <clears throat> and if you got to go, you got to go. This will be on YouTube, so you can check it out later. Um, anyway, on Friday, October October 4th, Venus and Scorpio will try and uh, Saturn retrograde in Pisces at 14 degrees and seven arc minutes, right? And so, again, this is part of the emotional support triangle during uh, this eclipse, but um, Venus perfects this, uh, this harmonious aspect on Friday the 4th. This can help stabilize relationships, right? Saturn is great with limits and boundaries. It helps us to recognize our boundaries. Um, Venus is our likes and dislikes, right? And Saturn helps us to say no, right? Saturn helps us to be like, this is my space, right? And so this is a water triumph. So it's happening in the emotional and the in the emotional realm and in the feeling function. So what feels right and what doesn't feel right. And, uh, you know, learning to honor Right? And I think Saturn supports us in honoring saying no and being like, this doesn't feel right. And so, you know, one of the things that might come up is like, what do our boundaries look like? And I think that this is a really important question, you know, 
And for me, it's been a helpful visualization. And I remember a friend of mine was talking to me years ago and they were talking to this older woman, right? And they were talking about boundaries and my friend um, or this older woman asked my friend, what do your boundaries look like? And my friend was like, you know, it's like razor wire and machine gun nests. It was like the Maginot line, right? Like trenches, fortifications. Like if you come close, like if you come too close, I'm gonna hit you with a spotlight, right? And then like, you know, armed guards are gonna surround you. And one, the older lady was like, wow, that's intense. You know, my boundaries... Like you, you ever look? You ever been to a museum, right? You like you go to a museum, and like you know, there's no razor wire, there's no fences, there's no guns. You just know not to touch the paintings, right? My friend was just like, right, and these both boundaries, right? You know, you can have a velvet rope which is at times more powerful than razor wire and machine gun nests, right? You can have a space like a museum, which just by entering, you know how to act right. You know that you don't touch the paintings, right? You know to look at them with awe. So I think that, you know, this <clears throat> moment helps us to really think about our boundaries and what our boundaries look like and what our boundaries can look like. Yeah, another part of this, is that Saturn helps us to get real, right? And I think that part of Saturn's work in Pisces is this reality check and cleaning up some of the uh, Neptunian dream and illusion and confusion. And I think that Saturn is like, okay, wake up, right? What are you actually gonna do about this? You know, and I think in this trying to Venus, Saturn is helping us to get out of fantasy or getting out of longing getting out of what could have been or what should have been, what I didn't do, what wasn't enough. It helps us to bring in, bring us into the practical reality of the now, right? And, you know, how, uh, and I think that this, that this um, reality of the now is also very shaped and supported by our value system, which is Venus, Right. So uh, Saturn helps us to take off the rose colored glasses and um, to accept what is real and what is now and how how our reality is in relation to our values. And so and I'm going to sort of land the plane with this, but <clears throat> in thinking about all of this and getting real in our value system, it reminded me of the four practice principles of Zen from Joko at the Zen Center in San Diego. Right. And um, I was in a Sangha that used to um, open the meditation with these four practice principles. And, you know, I think that they're sort of interesting in relation to the astrology of the moment. And so here it is. Caught in the self, centered dream, only suffering. Holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher. Being just this moment, compassion's way. And so what does this mean, right? I'll kind of break it down. The first part, caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, right? When we are caught up in our self-involved narratives, we, are, we separate ourselves from others and from the world. And as humans, we long for connection, and there is this sense of separation that is created by this self-involved narrative or uh, this self-centered dream, which relates and re uh, results in suffering, right? So this kind of narrative processing, right? This is me in relation to everything else, right? This is what I got to do in these old stories, I think, uh, keep us in this self-centered dream, which uh, perpetuates our suffering, right? So <clears throat> holding to the self holding to self-centered thoughts exactly the dream. Right? The suffering of a self-centered dream is the suffering of trying to hold on to and maintain a uh, permanent point of reference, right? A permanent unchanging me in like a uh, changing world, right? And we can see this as Saturn struggling to maintain order and a sense of separation and the individual ego. However, 
um, all this does is reinforce the dream and pulls us deeper into the simulation in a sense of separation and isolation. Right. The suffering is created by trying to uh, cling to uh, uh, an unchanging and rigidly fixed identity in this shifting flow of life, which ultimately will never work. Right. And um, as we cling to the dream, it's just the dream. Right. As we uh, want to know more in the simulation, it just pulls us deeper into the simulation. Right. So three, each moment life as it is, the only teacher. So this reminds us that each moment holds this opportunity to grow and learn, that moment to moment, we have an opportunity to be in connection with the universe, with the stuff, with ourself, with all of life, with each breath, right? We are taking the outside in, and with each out breath, we are bringing ourselves out into the world, right? And so we are always in this relationship with the world and we sort of lose that as we get lost in the in the dream right each moment provides us the choice to reject what is happening or to cling to it right or it gives us the opportunity to lean into a secret third thing and moment to moment we get to be in the flow of life and to learn from it and to grow along with it right so this moment is a teacher Right. This moment allows you to tune into the lesson that nature wants to teach you. Right. And we in each moment, we have the opportunity to learn and grow and interact with life and are really living in an organic way. Right. <clears throat> and so for being just this moment, compassion's way. And so empathy is feeling what somebody else is feeling. And compassion is the ability to witness somebody else's feelings or their suffering without getting sucked into it. And it is allowing everything to just be as it is, without clinging or rejecting or wanting to change or wanting to fix. And that's really the essence of compassion, the ability to witness and to allow something to be just what it is. And so with that, my friends, um, I will round out this talk and thank you very much for tuning in and for uh, being just how you are. And during this week and during this eclipse, you know, uh, I want to just suggest, right, being with whatever arises, right, being, uh, just being able to witness, right, and uh, being with, with whatever it is just in this moment, Right, in compassion's way, you know, and learning from it um, without clinging, without rejecting, just noticing, right, and being just this moment in compassion's way. Thank you all for being out there. I uh, appreciate you all. And uh, yeah, I uh, hope you have a blessed week. Um, I hope you all care for yourselves and each other. And, uh, you know, if you feel like donating to uh, support efforts in, you know, the Middle East or in Appalachia, uh, support that, you know, do what feels good and whatever allows you to be in compassion's way. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all next week. Same wizard time, same wizard channel. And until then, uh, may the force be with you. And also, uh, I may, if I'm feeling insane, I may produce a radio show for uh, this week. I don't know. It's been a rough one so far and it's only Monday, but if I can, um, I'll, I want to put out a radio show because uh, Chris Christopherson just passed away and I love him and I want to uh, honor him in song, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if I do, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Carrie. If I do, I will uh, put it up in my stories um, and you can always find it uh, on SoundCloud at Camp Wizard Camp. And so anyway, uh, that's it. That's all the astral weather that is fit to print, my friends. Be well out there, and I'll see you next week. Take care, y'all. May the Force be with you. Bye now.